Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Concordia co-founder and CEO, Matthew Swift, and former Secretary of Transportation, Elaine Chow. I was also Secretary of Labor. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, thank you very, very much, Madam Secretary. So, uh, Elaine Chow, former Secretary of Transportation, former Secretary of Labor, um, a, an incredible storied career, but also, most importantly, a great friend to Concordia and, and, and a frequent guest, which we've, we've always been grateful for. I, uh, we just heard a conversation about supply chains, and I, I can't help but think back to your Secretary of Transportation, and you're told that the country is going to have to shut down yeah. due to a pandemic. What is the first, what are the first series of things you do to keep supply chains functioning in the, at the beginning of a global pandemic? Well, if you recall, it took us uh, a while to understand uh, what this pandemic was. And I wanna stop and say, I see President Uribe there. President, so nice to see you. <laughs> and then the President, President Trump at that time declared a national emergency on March 13th, 2020. And the first concern that we had at the Department of Transportation was to keep the supply chain moving, open, and operational, obviously. And part of that was air, highways, rail, pipelines, trucks. So our number one concern was that the national airspace not be shut down because it was emblematic of our national pride and of the United States of America. Now, air traffic fell by 94%. So basically, there was less than 6% of airplanes flying and passenger traffic. But we wanted to make sure that essential personnel, supplies could traverse the country if they needed to, medical personnel, emergency personnel, and so we needed to make sure that the air traffic controllers didn't get sick. Mm -hmm. If you see air traffic control towers, they're closed, small, confined spaces with air traffic controllers who come in different times and they are nearly on top of each other. So we had to initiate a new protocol that had them come in as a team so that if anyone got sick, we can remove the whole team. Number two, we had to have a redundant operational center so that if, let's say, Pittsburgh went down or if New York City went down, the air traffic can still be channeled by another air traffic control center. And then um, number two, we had 288,000 Amer Americans who were stranded overseas because the emergency order occurred so quickly. They could have been in country, most of them were tourists, mm -hmm. and they didn't know that this was going to occur. And then even if they didn't know that we would take this action, mm -hmm. their country of visitation was subsequently shut down. So then we had to route these you know, hundreds of thousands of Americans abroad to other countries and find them routes in the second country, third country. So that took quite a lot of effort in conjunction with the State Department. And then also on the highways, State Departments of Transportation began to shut down rest stops. Well, what are truckers going to do? Yeah. Or if you are in family, you have an emergency um, you know, reason for traveling, what happens? So we basically worked with the State Departments of Transportation to open up the rest areas, at least to allow people to visit. And then we also allowed private concessionaires, mm -hmm. people who hitherto had not been able to sell private, privately you know, food mm -hmm. or refreshments, uh, give them a waiver to allow them to supply the food. So that worked out. And then so truckers were just complete heroes, people in the railroads who made sure that the railroads were working, air traffic controllers, and people who peopled and made our transportation system work were just incredible heroes during this period. Consequently, you didn't see any empty shelves, I hope. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> there was food and stuff. But not, and not to put you on the spot, but were mm -hmm. we, one, were we prepared for this, I mean, was did you were there things in place that you think we were ready for, and what areas do you think we now are ready for, having learned from this experience? I think we reacted incredibly well. Not only us, meaning the federal level, 
but also at the state and local level too, because there had been obviously some anticipation and obviously a great deal of anxiety as to what was happening. So at the department, we were already planning that in case we had to shut down the system, what will we do? And we were very, very adamant that the national airspace was not going to close. So shifting gears a bit to, to technology, right. um, we're seeing such a remarkable transformation in technology, yeah. um, in automotives, in space travel, and in, in every form of travel pretty much technology is in train travel, everything. What, what do you see as some of the most exciting things happening in the country today as a ro result of this technological revolution? Well, if you're in the t in transportation sector, this is about the most exciting time to be in this sector. And if, if you're not, you're going to see some pretty amazing changes if you are not already. You're beginning to see uh, the beginnings of self-driving cars. Uh, in California, Tesla, for example, it's a level two. It basically, the car can hug the white lines of the highway and basically run itself. It is we, the federal government, that is very concerned about safety that still requires a human driver behind the wheel. And we require that human driver to touch the wheelbase every so often to yeah. know, to give you know, indication that there's somebody there, there's someone in control. It is, so we've got automated vehicles, self-driving cars, we've got drones. Mm -hmm. Drones are now doing so many more things than we ever expected. They're used for inspections, Drones are now used to examine, inspect, you know, hundreds of miles of railroad tracks. They're used to inspect, you know, um, nuclear power stations, and some people don't want to get too close to them. So forest fires, when that happens, and in the aftermath of Hurricane uh, Harvey and Maria, we use drones mm -hmm. to assess the damaged areas to see what would be, you know, needed in terms of rehabilitation, repairs. And then also the beautiful aerial photography that we see these days. So drones are all part, increasingly part, of our everyday life. And you, anyone can buy it for about $500, $1,000. You do have to register it. Because, and that's an issue we can talk about because we want to know what is in the skies. Mm -hmm. Then we also have commercial space. Uh, we did a lot with commercial space. Prior to 2017, the United States was like... Um, you know, number seven, number six in commercial space. That didn't used to be the case. And in 2018, 2019, the United States once again reclaimed our number one ranking. And so what the previous administration did was to make it easier. And we are taking the lead in terms of commercial space. We have um, reusable rockets, which dramatically decreased the cost of launching and relaunching uh, rockets. So all of that has propelled the United States into a number one position, which is why innovation is so important in transportation because innovation is part of, number, it's the number one tr uh, export of the United States. Now for us and the federal government uh, being regulators, it's really easy to make everything safe. You just tell everybody, don't move. Yeah. <laughs> then we will be totally safe. But that's not obviously desirable nor realistic. So the role of a regulator should be to address legitimate public concerns about safety, security, and privacy without hampering innovation. Is government ready for that though? The speed of innovation has accelerated so quickly. Is government able to keep up? No, <laughs> simple answer. The government never is able to keep up by virtue of the fact that we are you know, more, we have different goals. Uh, in the private sector, you can be just for totally for innovation and for speed and dynamism. That's your, that's your goal. But for the government, our role is to ensure safety, security, privacy, and also justice to make sure that we provide an open forum in which people of differing opinions mm -hmm. have a place to voice them. Mm -hmm. And that means that we have to be more cautious. Mm -hmm. so, so that's why I'd say for the regulators, we need to do our job but we, the best thing we can do is to make sure that we are not hampering innovation, which is the number one export of the United States to the rest of the world. Are we in a competitive, currently, are we in a competitive position globally for innovation today? Is the U.S. the best place? I still believe so because we are a free nation. 
So, you know, Steven Spielberg said this supposedly once. I don't know. I never heard from him. But he said, when I was a kid, meaning Steven Spielberg, you know, I, I did crazy things. I thought these crazy thoughts, and my mother believed me. And he said, if I were in a different country with a different culture, people would think I'm crazy. So our society, our culture here, has incredible tolerance for differences. I mean, what city would call themselves weird and say so with pride? Austin, Texas. <laughs> I mean, in many other countries, you would never have a city declare itself as being weird. That's kind of like weird, don't you think? <laughs> so, so, um, the, so, you know, the complete, the, the, the tremendous freedoms that we have here mm -hmm. to let people's thinking roam and think what they want to gives us a tremendous edge. But what, it's being challenged, no question about it. What do you say to those, the critics who will say, too much freedom is given to the private sector. Elon Musk is controlling oh, space and so controlling the highways now. I mean, what do you say to those critics? Well, I'm an immigrant to this country. I didn't come here until I was eight years old. And the freedoms and the opportunities in this country are unparalleled. Oh, people want, you know, the president of um, Uruguay is here. I went to the inauguration of the, you know, the Uruguay president in 2005. And while it was a socialist government for the first time in 200 years, so there were all these socialists out there protesting the United States. Little me, you know, I was like. And yet, they were wearing American baseball hats. They were caps. They were wearing American t-shirts, sometimes with English misspelled. And they were demonstrating outside of a building behind them that said Bank of America. They were listening to American music, watching American movies. I mean, you know, our soft power is so incredibly appealing because bottom line, it allows each one of us to fulfill our own potential as we define it. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of freedom is just so appealing and it, it's not rivaled any place in the world. And so I don't think the private sector has too much uh, power. I think the regulators need to regulate, but I also know that the private sector has been responsible for lifting hundreds of millions of people just in the 30 years, um, you know, recently, uh, moving hundreds of millions of people from ag agrarian mm -hmm. society into a much higher quality of life, much higher standard of living. We so the free enterprise system is still the best way to, again, shore up and ensure that people have good quality of life and standards of living. Frank Luntz hosted this panel yesterday with a group of six students from the University of Kentucky, and um, there seemed to be equal skepticism of capitalism as there also is socialism, and, and almost a didn't... The, a, well, they're going to get their chance pretty soon, yeah. if there's money where their mouth is. <laughs> yeah. So, but what, I mean, what do you, you've been in public service for a long time. I believe in public service. But it's seen at a time when there's more skepticism to getting into public service. Do you do you see the tone of our debates and conversations and those differences that exist with people? When do you think that it will improve? Because it doesn't feel like it's improved. I sure hope that it does improve soon. And I believe in civility in expressing differences of opinion. But our country is very, very divided right now. But it's not as divided, for example, as 1861 when we had a civil war. And so our country has incredible tolerance for differences of opinions. And um, I think, uh, you know, I think that the, uh, the partisanship mm -hmm. in our country is discouraging. And I think we've got to do more with that, better with that. I think social media contributes to that as well, mm -hmm. because uh, it allows everyone to kind of uh, to speak out. Uh, but again, our ability to uh, brook each other's differences is a hallmark of a strong democracy. Mm -hmm. And I hope we keep that, but also introduce some civility into our dialogue. Talk a little bit in, the, in our last minute, talk a little bit about uh, Kentucky. This is the first time Concordia's yes. ever held a summit focused so on the delighted. U.S. heartland. Uh, we chose Lexington, Kentucky for a number of reasons. One of them is our partnership with the University of Kentucky. But another reason is that Kentucky is within 24 hours distance of 90% of the country and therefore a major hub for transportation, for manufacturing. But talk about the future for Kentucky. 
Well, first of all, welcome to my state. I'm a proud Kentuckian. I got here as quickly as I could. <laughs> Kentucky is ideally uh, situated, as you Matt mentioned. So UPS is here. We also have Fidelity and many other companies, financial companies, in northern Kentucky, which is right near the Cincinnati Northern Kentucky Airport. Uh, we have, uh, we're known for bourbon, for horse racing. If you want thoroughbreds, the best thoroughbreds are here in Kentucky. And we have Kentucky Derby coming up the first Saturday in May, and I hope that you'll take advantage of that and learn all about this wonderful state that I'm so proud to be affiliated with. Will you be at the Derby? Absolutely. Oh, all right, thank you very, very much, Madam Secretary. Great thank to see you. you. Thank you. Thank you.